So uh, this is what we're calling session one of our online membership training. We have five items on the agenda. Um, I'm gonna start with where we are as far as numbers and statistics and, and things like that. And um, after that, we will go to Lynn Lazar, our district membership chair, who will talk about different styles of meetings and types of meetings and memberships and options that you might want to investigate or, or consider, things that we have seen working in other places. Um, we'll come back to me with part three, and I will talk about the use of public image and media and printed materials and how you can use those to attract new members. Um, and then we'll go back to Lynn for part number four, um, talking about alternative membership types, um, things like corporate, honorary, stuff like that. And then we'll finish off with number five with me talking about diversification and what that really means, that it's more than just the color of our skin or whatever. So um, I will also mention, and I'll mention it again at the end, we already have a date scheduled for our next meeting in February. That will be February the 18th. Um, and Billy Black will be leading that meeting um, on how to do a Discover Rotary event um, because they were very successful. And we're going to dedicate an entire session to that um, uh, so that we can um, talk about that. And then in March, we're going to talk about um, satellite clubs and more specifically, like how those can work for you, what questions you might have. And then in April, we're going to move on to membership engagement. So tonight we're talking about attraction. I'm going to begin tonight with where we are, some statistics on where we are as a district. Um, some of you may remember I sent out some numbers at the end of the year. By mid-December, you guys, we were rocking and rolling. We were at plus 44 for a high in membership for our district, which is incredible. Um, I am sad and disappointed and oh, very um, a little anxious to tell you that as of right now, we're at plus six as of right now for the entire district. Um, so that was a huge bloodbath that we took at the end of the year when people started cleaning up their, their rosters. Um, so it's really important that people do that throughout the year. Um, and hopefully we don't have the same thing happen come the end of um, June. Uh, but in addition to that, let me tell you that not only did we go from plus 44 to plus six, this year our district has started four brand new satellite clubs since July 1 that combined have a total number of new members of 52. All right, so I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. Plus 52 new members just in four satellite clubs, and y'all, we're only at plus six for the year. So to me, that really reemphasizes just how critical it is that we really stay on top of this year round and that we have strategies. Um, you've heard us say on more than one occasion, um, hope is not a strategy. You know, well, I hope we're gonna get some new members. You have to have a plan. And so, um, Hopefully um, uh, we can, if anybody wants to know current numbers for their district, if you go on to DACDB and log on and you're on the homepage over on the far left side on dashboard navigation, you should see a link that says district statistics. And Billy, I'm gonna ask you, I see you're logged on now. Can everyone see that? It's not just us that can see that, is that correct? They should be able to, but that is, that number is not always uh, accurate because, because it's a more of an attendance. Sure, but it's it's a good place to at least look quickly yeah. and see that if you don't want to log into my Rotary and get um, up-to-date statistics. So, um, but that's where I can look at it right now and I can go to each individual club and I can see who's plus and who's minus. Um, and I will say that um, right now we have about six clubs that are even for the year um, and we have about 18 that are positive, but we have 26 clubs that are negative. And some of them are really big negative numbers. Um, uh, so what I'm gonna say is that the clubs that are doing really, really well, not, I mean, taking out satellites, um, Philip Reed's club, Rotary Club of Hickory um, is doing really well um, as far as Rotary clubs. And then uh, Four Seasons, my club, um, and then there's a bunch of satellites that are doing well. Um, so if you want to know what those clubs are doing, you might want to get in touch with Philip Reed. Um, you might want to talk to me or to Jean, Jean Carr, who's there. Uh, Jean can wave so you can see him. Um, he is the membership chair in my club. Those are the top two as far as actual clubs. And then there are satellites that are doing very well, like Blowing Rock, um, uh, Cheryl Sport Terrell, Pisgah Forest, and Silva. And so those are the four that if you want to know more about how their satellite clubs are being successful, write those names down. Um, we can put you in touch with those membership chairs as well. Um, but those are where we are as of right now. Um, 
again, the numbers are dismal. I mean, it is scary to watch those things coming in every day. Um, so when you do have folks that are leaving your club, remind them about the Passport Club, which is a great option for people who um, maybe can't make it to your meetings or can't afford a full meal meeting anymore, but would like to still remain active in Rotary. We have ways that they can do that either through a satellite club maybe in your community or in the Passport Club. So and we're far more clubs that are negative than are positive. Okay, so we will move on to the next section and I will restart my timer. I'm going to turn it over to Lynn Lazar, who is our district membership chair at Rotary Club of Silva, um, who's going to talk about um, some options that you may or may not have considered when it comes to meeting styles. All right, so let's talk about different kinds of meeting styles. Our, we have a lot of traditional Rotary Clubs. We meet at breakfast or at lunch, occasionally in the evening, and we have that as a meal, then we do our meeting, we may sing, we may do happy dollars, etc. But we have a lot of traditional style Rotary Clubs, and that's not bad. But we also need to look at other options to attract other people so that people who are not as comfortable with that traditional style, or perhaps who can't come at times like lunch, or perhaps can't afford lunch. Uh, a lunch club can be more expensive. So I want to talk about um, things like, uh, Tiffany's already mentioned the Passport Club. The Passport Club, you can be a member of the Passport Club and then you can do projects with other clubs in the, in the district or out of the district if you're um, traveling or something like that. So that gives you an option. They meet twice a month on Tuesday evenings. And they meet, um, it's a more casual setting, and you buy your meal or your beverage or whatever at that time. So that is a, a, an option that gives people a little bit of flexibility. Um, a lot of the satellite clubs are the same, th that kind of format. We have several that meet in the evening, but we have one that meets um, in the morning as well. So the Satellite Club gives you a different option for time and setup for the meeting. And some clubs have switched to a 2-1-1 format instead of having a traditional meeting every week. They will have one meeting or two meetings a month, and then they'll do a service project and a fellowship. And so that gives some other options. And if you're not paying for meals on those other two meetings, that can also help with cost. Um, as you might notice, meals and cost is a, an issue that a lot of people are struggling with. So um, attracting younger Rotarians, people who are new in their career, people who are raising a family, they may not have the option to be part of a lunch club where the cost is a little bit higher. So we want to be able to provide some other options and help you think about ways that you can make your club attractive to other people who might need some of those um, options. Think about how you run your club. <clears throat> I'm not saying there's anything wrong with how you run your club, but think about it and think about what other people see. A lot of times Rotary is, um, you, you know everybody, it's your place, and you get to go in, and you get to be comfortable, and you see your friends, and this is the way you do things, and this has always been the way you did things, and you're happy with that, but what's somebody that is coming in going to see when they come to your club? My club does happy dollars, and we have moved happy dollars from the beginning of the meeting to the end of the meeting. We did that because we have so many happy dollars. We're very vocal. I'm part of the Rotary Club of Silva. And we were running over and taking time from our speaker. So several years ago, we moved our happy dollars to the end of the meeting. So we ask our speakers to finish up about, we meet from 12 to one, we ask our speakers to finish up about quarter of one, and that's when we get happy dollars. And occasionally we run out of time and don't have time for happy dollars. But it's better not to have time for happy dollars than it is to invite a speaker, have somebody set up, get them in for lunch, 
and tell them that they have 15 or 20 minutes for a presentation and then we run over with happy dollars and they have five minutes um, so think about those kinds of things um, do you do a prayer at your meeting or not and if you do a prayer what kind of a prayer is it there are several rotary uh, themed prayers available that are more um, that take into account other religions as well some clubs do not do a prayer in order to not offend anyone and so consider that as you are trying to attract new members what are people going to see when they come into your club do you do a program or not <clears throat> a lot of times clubs get in a rut and you have the same speakers over and over year to year and there are often speakers who are presenting projects and um, hoping for funding and that kind of stuff so think about the kinds of speakers that you have at your club so that you know what you have as far as what other people are seeing um, and that's kind of important you does your club need to change and i can't make that decision and tiffany can't make that decision that decision belongs to your club but you need to look at your club from the outside especially if you're having trouble with membership if you're if, if your members are dropping like flies think about what you are presenting in your club now if you change if you make some sort of a change it is likely that you will lose members because not everybody likes change and but that is not always a bad thing change can be very positive you just have to determine what kind of change is needed and what your club feels comfortable with you may be very comfortable with the, the format and the layout the meals wherever where you meet what time you meet etc but are there others in your community who would be great rotarians but they can't come to a lunch club or they can't come to a, a breakfast club if so it might be time to look at a satellite club and that's what has happened with rotary club of silva we have traditionally been a lunch club um, founded in 1928 and we had a lot of different um we we've had some changes over the years but we've had a lot of people who were not able to be there for the lunch format and in the the satellite club two current members of the rotary club of silva switched over to that and two former members of the rotary club of silva joined the satellite club because the evening format was better for them so don't be afraid of change talk to your members and see what you need and and, and explore some options i will add three quick notes while you guys get your questions ready or raise your hand or whatever three things i wanted to share with you number one another option for a meeting um is a pop-up service project and we rolled Thank this you. out to our president's elect back in january and february of last year at their president-elect training um, those have been very popular with folks if you aren't familiar with them either ask your club president what that is or um, email me or billy or, or lynn will be happy to share with you there is a list of potential uh, ideas for pop-up service projects it is on our district website in the president's library under pets um, or maybe pre-pets sorry but everyone can access that you're welcome to download that or we can um, get it to you if you'd like second thing was um, uh, lynn made a very good point about um, evaluating your club and looking at it how other people look at it how other people outsiders see it uh, we did a video a couple of years ago um, uh, uh, called How to Not Hold a Rotary Meeting, and it's on my YouTube channel. It's about eight minutes long. If you would like to watch that, it really makes you think about what your club may or may not be doing. It's very humorous. It's lighthearted. You can show it to your club if you want, or you can just watch it and get some ideas. We're going to be working on a part two of that coming up soon. Uh, but that's on the Tiffany Irvin YouTube channel. If, uh, it's called How to Not Hold a Rotary Meeting, um, if you want to look that up. And the third thing I was going to share with you, the Rotary Club of Morganton did something really fun recently um, because we get into that habit of putting uh, sitting in the same seat every week. And I know we've all done things where we give them a number when they come in and tell them they have to go sit at table number, whatever number they draw. Um, 
uh, at the Rotary Club of Morganton recently, she handed everybody a candy bar when they walked in, one of those little mini candy bars. So it was a Snickers or Butterfinger or M&M or whatever. And they thought, oh, this is great candy. Thank you so much. And she goes, now you have to go find the table that has that candy bar written in the middle of it. And so um, it was just random. But instead of handing them a number and them thinking, oh, great, now I have to go sit with somebody else. Uh, she surprised them and said, here, you're at the M&M table or whatever. So I thought that was really cute and um, just something different. And I'm down to 10 seconds. So I'm going to stop and see if anybody has any questions about all of that. I know we're talking really fast, so I apologize, but we have lots of good information for you guys. All right, so the next segment we're going to talk about, I'm starting my timer again, is the importance when we're talking about attracting new members, the importance of using your public image team um, and media um, and, and even printed documents or printed materials. And so we've been saying for a long time that it's really critical that our membership team and our public image team work together. And so I'm going to encourage you, whichever one you're on uh, in your club, that you please work with the other one as well. And I invited both of those chairs to this meeting tonight, and we'll continue to do that because I do think it's important that they work together on some of those things. Um, so I just want to give you um, five fast ideas of things that you may or may not have ever seen or tried um, that fall into this category. And the first one is your Rotarian magazine. I want you to think about what do you do with your Rotarian magazine? Do you, okay, first of all, I hope you read it. Um, and then after you read it, what do you do with it? Do you toss it? A lot of people I know take it to the doctor's office or the library or to their office and put it in the lobby where other folks can read it. Mine just happens to be sitting right here because I haven't read it yet, but it's right here in my floor. I have a lot of mess in my floor. But um, let me tell you what two other clubs do that, um, that I've heard about that I think are great ideas. Uh, my club, uh, at not, it wasn't my idea, another guy in our club, he uh, brings his and collects them from other members and keeps them in our little tub of stuff at our meeting location. And when we have a guest uh, come to our meeting, he gives them one when they leave, not at the beginning of the meeting, but before they leave that night, he gives them a copy of an older Rotarian magazine and says, this will give you some more information about who we are and what we do. And they get to see the big picture of Rotary, which I think is a brilliant idea. Um, uh, the, and then there's a club in um, Southport, North Carolina. They collect them and they give them to their Interact and Rotaract club members, which I thought was another brilliant idea because those folks need to see the bigger picture of Rotary as well. So um, I think everybody has heard the idea of putting them in your office or donating them to the library or something. But I want you to think about what do you do with your Rotarian magazine? And there might be other ideas out there that you we haven't even thought of that some of you may go, oh, I never even thought about the Rotarian. And maybe it's one particular article. Um, the Rotary Club of Murphy um, and, and several others, I think, um, maybe Hickory Sunrise, I believe as well. They have a trivia question at their meeting every week that one person is responsible for pulling something out of here. Now that doesn't come under attraction. That's more about engagement. Um, but they pull a trivia, they, they figure out one little trivia question out of this to see if anybody read it, um, which I think is a, a great little idea too. But think about how you can use this as an attraction tool um, to, uh, to let more people in your community know about that Rotary is bigger than Hendersonville or Lenore or Caldwell or Lincolnton or Franklin or Silva or wherever we all are. Uh, Rotary is international. That's our last name. And this is a great way for you to tell people that. So that's number one. Number two, um, banners and tents. How many of our clubs go out and do public image things at your local festival or um, at your events that you're doing fundraising and you're borrowing a tent from somebody's um, either their university tailgate tent or a plain white tent that they have in their garage. Spend a little bit of money, get a nice tent that has the Rotary logo and your name on it. Um, uh, my club got one a couple of years ago. The Rotary Club of Hendersonville just had theirs today. It just came in. So they took it to their club meeting today and put it up inside their meeting space and did a ribbon cutting so that their entire club could see um, what they had done. Uh, so that now everybody knows that they have it. So every time they're doing an event in public, you pop up that 10 by 10 bright royal blue tent with the yellow cog on it, Rotary Club of Hendersonville or whatever your name is. They're not cheap. They're a couple hundred bucks, but it's well worth it as a piece of public image that you could be used to attract members. Um, You'd be amazed, maybe you wouldn't be amazed, but the number of events that we get pictures of our PI team, Tammy, Billy, and, and they can, and Joan, I don't know if she's here or not, but they can back me up on this, that um, we get pictures all the time of events and it's got some other company's name 
not just on the t-shirts, but on the banners and, and all that stuff. So think about those banners and tents. Um, if you need help ordering a pop-up banner, you can order them from Russell Hampton. You can also order one from your local printer if you want to as well. Um, and any of us on the public image team are happy to help you with that as well. Um, but it, it might be worth it to have that for a hundred bucks that you can pop up, maybe you carry them in a little bag on your shoulder. Um, and they really are worth it to have that with people in your community on it versus some random person that that nobody knows if they see the police chief or the fire chief and they find out that they're one of your people of action um, that that is an attraction method for you to get more people to your club also when we talk about signage um, the writer clubs in franklin have done a great job of replacing all those big round cogs that are um, when you drive into town with new signage that has the new logo and branding image on it that says um Rotary Club, you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's got the cog and the name beside it versus just the one big round cog. Um, and, and that's an excellent uh, expense. Maybe, I don't know, Billy can speak to whether they had to pay for them or if they had to, if they worked with the, the town or the city, how that worked. But um, he could probably share that information with you if you want it afterwards. Um, that's who you would reach out to because um, they did a great job with that. And then the signage at your meeting location. Is it one of those brown plaques that says Rotary meets here that you know, 100 years old that was put there when your club first formed? Or is it a sandwich board that sits out on the sidewalk? Or is it um, a window sign? Is it a decal? Is it a, um, a real estate sign that you can pop in the window? There's a lot of different things that we can do now. We're not limited to, you know, your grandpa's Rotary Club of that brown plaque that hangs on the brown wall in the brown building. Um, you know, do something bright and colorful to attract people's attention. Because you never know if they're moving to that town or if they're visiting. Um, just like Tim Gaffney was saying a little while ago, he has moved here from Florida, um, or Georgia, sorry, from Georgia um, to the Murphy area. And, you know, he now was able to find that, that club there. So you want to make sure your banners, your tents, your signage and all is, um, is appropriate. Number three, I'm running out of time. I'm going to go a little bit faster. So I apologize. Um, printed materials like thank you notes, business cards. Um, the Rotary Club of Bryson City printed up little business cards that said, You're, be my guest for a free lunch, and their members get X number of them, and they hand them out to someone to invite them to come to their meeting, um, and that way they know who invited them. They can put their name on them or whatever. Um, you can talk to Bryson City if you want a copy of that. Um, and then they keep track of how many visitors have come and how many you know guest meals they owe and stuff like that as well. Um, but uh, uh, the Rotary Club of Clay County hands out those service above self or uh, four-way test coins. That's what they use and, and they order those from Russell Hampton, um, like a challenge coin for those of you who were in the military and remember doing challenge coins, that's way over my head. I apologize, but um, I understand that that's a thing and that's something that some of these clubs in our district are doing now um, and it's, it's very effective for some of those clubs. There, um, you just buy those coins, you, you give it to someone. A lot of people give it to their speakers. Um, you might want to consider giving it out to um, someone else to invite them to your club. Okay, number four um, is tabloids and inserts in the newspaper. Um, I know y'all know that because I do a lot of social media, y'all think I don't believe in traditional media anymore, but that's not true. Traditional media is really important. Um, the Rotary Club of Hendersonville does a, um, a newspaper insert in their newspaper once a year. It, 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 it accomplishes two goals. Number one, it's a fundraiser. They go out and sell the ads to raise additional money um, to cover the cost of printing and make a profit. And it's a public image tool for them. Um, and it's, I don't know, 16, 32 pages. I can't remember which. Um, and it's got stories about their members. It's got stories about the district. It's got stories about their history. It's got stories about their projects. Um, it's got a list of past presidents. Um, so that, and I have samples of those. There's a district in Charlotte that's done one a couple of times. There's several others that have done them as well. I'm happy to share copies of those if anybody wants to see them, or you can reach out to the Rotary Club of Hendersonville if you want to learn more about that. It's great not only as a as a fundraising tool, but as a public image tool and a way to attract new members. The key to all of these attractions, though, is follow up. If you're just putting stuff out there and you're not ever following up with these people, then that's a totally different issue that you're gonna to have to address. I'm running out of time. Number five, special events. Um, think about what's going on in your community and whether you should have a presence there to attract new members, whether it's handing out brochures or flyers about your club, 
or perhaps it's sponsoring an event. My club, for example, is the sponsor of the education award that's given out at the Chamber of Commerce annual dinner every year. So we are on stage in front of 300 people uh, that are there for the Chamber of Commerce presenting an award to an educator um, in our community. Um, I know a lot of you, a lot of your clubs do things like that as well. Um, but think about other special events. Every United Way um, does a day of caring. Has your club put together a team to go out and volunteer somewhere? Um, all of these opportunities are not only opportunities to put you out there in front of the community, but also to invite other people to go with you to try to attract new members. Um, think about the Rotary Awareness Months, um, Clean Water Month, uh, Vocational Month. There went my, my timer, did y'all hear that? So um, I, don't, I don't know how to turn it off, I'm so sorry. Um, and uh, um, the other months, Peace Month, um, you know, things like that. You can, uh, Education and Literacy Month, you could use that as an opportunity to invite um, you know, the, the teachers or the principals or the school administrators during Basic Education Month and have a program, not ask them to be the program, but talk to them about what Rotary does with education. So um, y'all know it's not thinking outside the box. There is no box. So think about things that you haven't tried before, but those Rotary Months are a great way to do that. Red Nose Day in May. Y'all know this is one of the things I did in my club four or five years ago. I showed up in early May, I brought those stupid red noses and I handed them to different people and I said, here, put this on, let me take your picture. They didn't even ask me why. They, and Jean will attest to this. They just went, okay, you know. And so we took pictures of them all and I put them all over social media on Red Nose Day. Well. Okay, so maybe that doesn't make someone come join my club today, but you know what it does? It makes them see that we have fun, that Rotary is fun, that we're full of you know fun people that are doing good. And Red Noses, when you go and buy them at Walgreens, they raise money for a lot of great organizations around the country, one of which is now Rotary International. I'm gonna say that that's because I started Red Nose Day here in Hendersonville, but I don't know. Working with your chamber of holidays, a lot of clubs, uh, Denver Lake Norman is doing a Valentine's themed dinner during February. It's a great opportunity to invite other people to come. Um, St. Patrick's Day, um, Halloween, uh, the Rotary Club of Hickory Sunrise does a great job with a Halloween uh, costume party. Um, so does, uh, and they do one at St. Patrick's Day as well. A lot of clubs do your fundraisers on holidays, like the 5Ks and the Firecracker and the vampire and all that stuff. Um, but think about what else you can do to attract members um, as part of those fundraisers that are tied to holidays. So those are my top five tips tonight. Y'all, I got a million of them, but um, if you find this helpful. Um, but these are the top five tips I wanted to give you tonight on how to use some public image and media and printed materials um, to attract new members. So I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions. You may want to you may want to put this on this table to, for toward the end of the meeting, but if you could talk just a moment about the committees that most clubs have, standing committees that most clubs have. Okay, sure. We can we can. Thank I'll you. add that to my little end of the thing. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Well, if no one else has questions about that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lynn, who is going to do our next segment as we talk about alter alternate membership types. Got it. I am going to start with something that I'm not aware of in our district, but my fiance is a Rotarian in South Carolina. We met through Rotary and his club has a couples membership option. And there's a couple, he's a doctor and a lot of times he can't get away. And so he and his wife kind of swap back and forth. If both of them come to a meeting, the second one pays for the meal or that's charged to their dues. But as a couple, a couple option, uh, especially for somebody who has a busy schedule or a demanding schedule that, that can't always make it, uh, that is an option you may want to consider. As I said, I don't know of any clubs in our district that do that. But once again, as Tiffany said, there's not a box, but let's think outside what we're used to thinking about. I want to talk about corporate memberships. And some people are in favor of corporate memberships, some are not. But let me give you kind of the, the quick what a corporate membership is. Uh, a company or university or entity has one member who joins Rotary. 
for example, the uh, Rotary Club of Silva has several corporate members and the hospital has one member and there are several other members who come to the club when that member can't make it. The uh, Western Carolina Athletics has a corporate membership. One person is the member, that person is the Rotarian. And, but if that person can't make it, if Michael can't make it, then somebody else comes to the meeting in his stead. Now that does a couple of things. It helps us not lose Michael because he, it, it's, if he was thinking of dropping out of Rotary because he can't always make it to the meetings, now there's an option for somebody else to come to the meeting. That introduces others to Rotary. So those other members of the uh, Western Carolina Athletics now see a little bit more of Rotary, not just when they're invited as a speaker, but they get to attend a meeting. The, the, there is one main member and that member is the Rotarian. That member is the voting member if there are things that the club votes on. That member is the one who has foundation dues uh our foundation responsibilities we expect them to contribute to the foundation they pay the dues although the organization may pay the dues that's up to the um the business organization university whatever we we always encourage others to um hopefully some of those uh members who are attending through that corporate membership would say, hey, this is really a neat organization. I'd like to be involved with this. Um, our school superintendent, Kim Elliott, a longtime Rotarian, but once she became superintendent, her responsibilities quadrupled at least, and it was really difficult for her to make it to meetings. So instead of dropping out, she changed that to a corporate membership, and there are other members of the school district who now attend meetings when she can't be there. That's a great option. And um, one of the things that the Rotary Club of Silva has, something that you kind of need to let people know is that the person who attends in the, in the member's stead needs to check in with the secretary so that you know who they are there for. Otherwise, you just have people showing up at the meetings and you don't get to know them. So that's that that takes a little getting used to and being sure that your member is communicating that clearly. So um, if you have other questions about corporate membership, feel free to ask me. We are um, Rotary Club of Silva had several members that we were afraid we were going to lose. And by switching their membership to a corporate membership, we have been able to maintain them as a Rotarian because they couldn't make it to meetings all the time. That's like one of the add, yeah, I want to add to that because um, the way the Silva Club does it works really well for them. There are other options. You can create whatever works in your club. Um, one of the things that I suggest you consider if you're considering corporate membership is that it doesn't help your membership numbers any, but it does help your engagement if you have people that, like Lynn said, are, are considering leaving. But if you want to use it to build your numbers, then you have to raise the price in order to accommodate those multiple people and make them actual members. And you can do that. You can make someone a corporate member, charge them even more um, and make them a corporate sponsor or something if you want, but make sure you cover um, all of their um, all of their their dues or their or their contributions for your foundation or whatever, um, but you could have a corporate member that pays five thousand dollars a year, x number of members for that, um, and that would actually boost your membership numbers and not just your engagement. So um, so there's a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, we put together um, a couple of years ago a concept of that that I'm happy to share. If anybody wants to look at it, you could play with the numbers and make it whatever works in, in your club. Um, and there's several other folks around the country and around the world that have done that. So we're happy to share that if it's something you're considering, but you need to know why you're doing it. Is it because you have people that you're afraid you're going to lose and you want to keep them engaged? Or is it because you want to boost your membership numbers? All right, Billy? Um, I want to make sure that everybody understands that you can't just do this. You must make a bylaw change and change your bylaws. 
Um, that's real important. And the other piece is, uh, as being DACTB, I go in and there are some clubs that have made the corporation the member. There is a live body that's the member. <laughs> Just make sure that, you know, corporations are not people in this case. But two things, bylaws and corporations. And I noticed we were supposed to talk about honorary. I haven't gotten there yet. Okay, I'll, I'll let you <laughs> jump in then. Okay, um, thank you for the mention on the bylaws. And Rotary Club of Silva has amended their bylaws, and we would be happy to share that if, um, if you have questions. Um, honorary members, the same thing. You have to amend your bylaws in order to uh, be sure that you're... Are, it must be voted on by the board, and it's a one-year term. They're not honorary members for life, and I think that's the biggest thing with an honorary, is each year they must be voted on again. All right, and what I want to talk about is... A, I think you need something. Do you not need something in your bylaws to to explain that, though? Okay. All right. Well, it's what I want to talk constitution. Okay. What I want to talk about is why you're ha why you have honorary members, and um, a lot of times an honorary member is somebody that you are going to say you have a long term member and they become ill and they're no longer able to attend meetings and you make them an honorary member. Um, and that's probably a short-term thing. Or you may want to honor somebody in your community. And that may be a short-term thing as well. So be aware of why you are doing an honorary membership and be sure that you know, um, like you could also make somebody an honorary Rotarian hoping that they will then become engaged and start um, get involved with the club and say, you know, I want to do this. But be sure the one year term is important because if you are going to have somebody as an honorary Rotarian, you do have to vote on that every year and your, your board has to approve that membership. And you also need to, so are you doing it for recognition or are you doing it for recruitment? Those are big things. You also need to think about things like, do they get your emails? And if they're not, I mean, if they are simply for recognition, um, that, that may be okay. But if they, if you're trying to recruit them, then you want to be sure they get your emails, your bulletins, anything that you're sending out so they know what's happening in the club and they can be more engaged and how you treat that honorary member. Um, do they pay dues? Do they, you know, do they pay their meals? How, how do you handle that? Your club needs to decide that because that, that is kind of a decision that the club needs to make. Others? Hold on. What do you guys think of adding your um, interact or, or, or uh, uh, um, Rotor Act, you know, Rotor Act uh, leaders, uh, when I say leaders, um, particularly in Rotor Act, if you have a, a president of Rotor Act at a community college, uh, if you have a, a leader of an interact at a high school, making them an honorary member for that year to encourage them to come to your meetings and stay in touch with what you guys are doing. So we are not allowed to put interact members in our database because they're under 18. They're considered students and they're minors. I, I wasn't so, talking interact members. I was talking Rotaract members. Only. Okay. So, okay. And so Rotaract, so um, I don't really have an opinion on whether you make them an honorary member or not. Some other folks might have an opinion on that. But what we are trying to get every club to do is to enter in their Rotaract members as a club because Billy has taken the time to enter every one of the Rotaract clubs and interact that we are aware of in the district. Um, and we're trying to get them to enter in their own community, their own uh, members' data, so that we can communicate with them. As many of you may remember, um, Rotaractors, uh, Rotaract is now part of Rotary, but that does not make Rotarians. Uh, sorry, that does not make Rotaractors Rotarians. It makes um, Rotaract members still Rotaractors, but Rotaract is part of Rotary. So we can enter them in the database. We do need to share, be sharing information with them. If you have a club that's not, um, that's not in there, please work with us to get that updated. But I don't have an opinion on whether, 
it would make them an honorary member or not. I mean, I, I think it goes back to what Lynn said a minute ago is that you got to decide why are you making them a member? Is it to honor someone? Like in our club, we have four or five members who have left that aren't able to come anymore. They're older. Um, they were very valuable members of our club. We made them an honorary. They're going to be there forever. I know Billy thinks that doesn't agree with that one, but that was something that we did for. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention when we talked about membership types, um, a lot of people ask us still about the rule of 85. And, you know, and Billy can correct me and some of the other folks who've been around a little bit longer, maybe, but um, the original intent of Rule of 85 was that you didn't have to, if you, your age and your number of years in Rotary combined equaled 85 or more, you did not have to meet the same attendance requirements as other Rotarians. Um, but now that none of us have attendance requirements, it is a moot point, except in the clubs that either A, still count attendance, or B, they count attendance towards their meal cost. So there are clubs out there that they keep up with attendance because if you miss but you go and do a makeup you can turn that in and you can get a meal credit for a meal that you may have already paid for so everybody does things differently um but think about uh, that rule of 85 i still get a lot of questions i got an email this week about one um and it's really i i, I don't mean to sound that it's irrelevant but it's irrelevant you know unless it's being used for some specific purpose in your club um uh, Billy, anything to add about Rule of 85? And Franklin Club uses it so that they don't have to come to meetings because they don't count against attendance. And Franklin still takes attendance, but they also don't have to pay for the meals in which they don't attend. So it's a monetary, like you said, that in another way. Um, it's really a monetary honorarium. Okay. And some people have the Rule of 35. Anybody 35? 35. Um, has different uh, billing schedules. So there again, just another way. Yeah, so if your age and your number of years in Rotary are less than 35, you could offer a discounted fee schedule. Um, the beauty of that, all of that, um, everybody's fee schedule for dues is gonna be different as long as they cover um, you know, RI and district dues and then whatever it is in your club. You might also think about um, associate members, although Rotary only recognizes two types, active and honorary, that's it. Um, if you want to do an associate member that pays a different fee, you're still going to have to make them an active member for them to count in your membership numbers, but you can charge them different and call them associate, but they're going to go into DACTV and into Rotary International as an active member, because um, those are the two kinds that Rotary recognizes are active and honorary. Um, you might also look at things like family memberships, like Lynn talked about, um, which could be not just couples, but families. Um, and then also um, young professionals, if you want to create an entirely different um, status level for them as far as what they pay, that's something that um, some clubs might look at as well. The big thing so, with this is to remember that we want to attract good people who want to do good in the world. And so think about ways that your club may be able to help people who may not be able to do some of that and, and what you are willing to do as a club your club needs to think about all these options and, and figure out what what they would like to do or what they're uh, willing to do, able to do, et cetera. So um, we have one more topic that I wanted to touch on. I'm gonna literally set my timer for three minutes so that we leave time at the end for questions. And that is just talking about diversity mm -hmm. and how that, um, uh, how that ties into your membership. And we can add this to the agenda for the next meeting if you guys wanna talk about it some more. Um, but what I wanted to stress is that our diversity is more than the color of our skin or our gender or our sexual orientation. I want you guys to think about diversity in, um, in more than membership, but tonight we're talking about membership. But think about classifications, obviously, because that's an easy one. You know, do you have a funeral director in your club? Do you have an attorney in your club or a banker or a tattoo artist or a hairstylist or an educator? Um, or perhaps your club has a website that hasn't been touched since 2007. Maybe you need a graphic designer or a web designer in your club. So think about those classifications that are missing. Think about what's missing from the table and think about how you can bring that to the table. And then um, money. And I, I bring this up because I've used this as part of my, my discussion around the district and other places where I speak that Everybody can't do the same thing. Um, I can't be a major donor in, in Rotary because I'm just trying to figure out how to pay my mortgage every month. Um, but I will work hard. And so don't discount those people who can't write big checks as potential members. Think about the diversity of your club in income level and in jobs as well, because I will work hard as hard as anybody in the club. I just can't write the big checks. 
Now, there will be people that can write you some big checks, um, but they're not going to show up and pick up trash on the Saturday. There will be people that will do both. Don't misunderstand. But you need all of those people in your club. And there are clubs out there that are going to say, we are a check writing club. That's all we want to do. If you can get away with it and that's the culture of your club and you don't want to change it, we are not here to tell you to change the culture of your club, but you have to know what that culture is. Um, but I, I mean, I, if, if you were only out there looking for, you know, professionals that, you know, show up in a business suit every day, you're never going to find the eBay store owner like me or, um, or, or what, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, uh, just as a point of reference for you guys, um, there are 525 district governors around the world, 525 uh, districts. Uh, this year, I am one of only 36 governors in the world under the age of 50. I don't know if you guys find that surprising or not, um, but to me, it's one of those things that we really need to be conscious of, that it's not just young professionals that are in their 30s and 20s, uh, but it's people in their 40s and 50s and those retirees that have time or money. Um, but it might be the younger people who uh, want to give back to their community or want to network or want a fellowship. So think about all of that when it comes to diversity and think about those people that are missing. We do want to think about those people who are different from us, whether it's their religion, their gender, their, um, their race, their gender identity, their sexual orientation, the language they speak, the food they eat. Um, I know nothing about people who uh, are vegans and, and don't eat meat because I just can't even fathom it. But, um, but that's something that I don't know anything about. So I need to learn more about. And I don't even know if we have any vegans in our club. I'm just saying that that's, when we talk about diversity, it is so much bigger than the color of our skin and male, female. And I just want us to think bigger picture when it comes to that. Public image, I wanna just jump back to public image. If you have a website, update it. If you're not gonna update it, get rid of it, take it down. The other piece is when you're uh, posting to Facebook and you have this great activity you just did, don't then pose in a line you know, and then put that on Facebook, take a picture of the action, and whatever you can, put the action in. Yep, and we'll talk about that some more when in our, in, as we talk about more public image stuff. That's a great point. Thank you, Billy. Um, so we, we are three minutes before seven o'clock, and I want to try to keep us on schedule. Um, I know that um, uh, someone, I forget who it was, asked the question about standing committees for clubs, and I'll just briefly say that that is going to depend on the club, because every club is different size, and has different projects, but I, I can tell you, um, just as a point of reference, what some of the, the committees are, if you want to write these down quickly, um, you might have a, um, a committee that ties into the, 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 uh, the six areas of focus. You might have a water committee and a, a peace committee, and you might have international, or you might have the, the, the areas of um, service. I'm, the word is not coming to me, I apologize. But you might have a community service committee. You might have an international service committee. You might have a youth services committee. You might have a vocational services committee and a club services committee. You might also have an admin committee, which is usually your president elect that kind of runs that and talks about things like programs, speakers. Um, you might have a, a fellowship committee that plans your socials. Um, you might even have a family of Rotary committee that's responsible for sending cards to people who have, have been missing or send flowers when someone dies or is in the hospital. Um, and make sure everybody's kept up to date on that. You should definitely have a public image committee, a membership committee, um, a foundation committee, um, and then you're going to want chairman of things like CART and polio, and um, uh, uh, maybe it's for RILA or Interact or Youth Exchange. Um, I'm looking at the list to see what else I'm missing. Uh, fundraising. Fundraising mm -hmm. might be Gotta a Gotta have fundraising place. mostly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you, if you're a large enough club, you might have someone that works just on alumni or, um, or your finance committee and your treasurer, um, but that's going to depend on, on how in-depth your club is, but those are some of the ones that we've thrown out. You can also go to um, myrotary.org and you can get a lot of this information there. There's an online training center there that I encourage you, if you haven't been to, to go to that. Um, log on, take a course on there. They have online courses of membership, public image. Um, youth protection, things like that. And when you do that and you complete the course, um, we get a record of everybody in our district who has done that. Your club presidents this year are tallying up the number of people in their clubs who um, have, have done online training classes because they're going to get points in their pink pages. 
and there might be some awards for that at the district conference that are uh, going to be surprises as well. So you can get a lot of information from that um, that as well. Um, so we're here to help you guys. If there's something specific that you heard that triggered that you want to know more about, email us and let us know that as well, and we'll be happy to um, to add that to another agenda or talk to you one on one. We've always got folks that are willing to come and answer questions and work with you. So it is 7.01, we have gone for exactly one hour. Um, and I wanna say thank you again for your, your time tonight because our time is precious. It is just as valuable a resource as your textbook. And I am so grateful for each of you for spending your time here tonight. I will leave you with one final to do and that is don't forget to go register for the district conference. <laughs> and, um, and make sure your clubs are aware of the past president's council meetings that are coming up uh, the first two weeks, weeks in February. I'm following um, uh, up on Governor Isaac's um, implementation of that last year and we're adding those. Uh, we've got them scheduled. They're on the DAC TV calendar. Um, and the next meeting of this committee, uh, February 18th, is already scheduled and on the DAC TV calendar as well. So you can already sign up for that and you'll have the Zoom meeting in there. So if I don't see any other hands raised or questions to ask, again, thank you so much for being here and we'll see you guys next time.